Hmm. Well, Brandon, probably the best thing to do is for you to, uh, uh, in fact, just introduce yourself uh, to the students. Tell them, you know, what it is you do and, and, and where, and then I'm going to have some questions for you about what life is like as a brand new associate at a large uh, law firm in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, as the professor said, my name is Brandon Deasy. I graduated from here uh, last May. I work for Troutman Sanders. I started there in September. I summered uh, there in 2011. And I'm in the environmental and toxic tort litigation department, which um, my practice gets split up into really two different things. One is very large, complex environmental cases of particular uh, interest to some of you maybe is Plant Juliet right here, or I'm sorry, the Plant Shear in Juliet is one of my clients they recently were sued for some pollution issues, I don't know. Uh, it was all over the news down here, but uh, so I defend Southern Company in that action, and then other similar big environmental cases, most of them are in federal court, that one is not. And then the other half of my practice is products liability which is basically what would be insurance defense in another firm, but the clients I represent in those cases are self-insured, and so they, instead of using an insurance defense firm where the insurance company is, is involved with picking the lawyers and things like that, they just come straight to us. It's almost an in-house uh, counsel role. We're, we do most of the work, uh, but they're small cases in state court and on those cases, I actually get to do uh, some kind of substantive work and handle the pleadings and things like that, whereas on the bigger cases, you can imagine, there's a hierarchy. Well, and that was going to be my question, because um, I was a brand new associate at a large law firm before you were born, <laughs> uh, and before most of the people in this room were born. Um, so I know what that was like then, but what is it like now? I mean, what do you actually do all day long and into the evening and early morning hours? Right, that is yeah. Very accurate on the timing there. But so on, on the bigger cases, a lot of it for me has been writing memos. Now, a lot of my um, colleagues, I guess, that started with me haven't had such a, a writing intensive practice. I have written an unbelievable amount of memos, and some of them are very long and very complex. So the and, memo writing they're doing now for yes, legal writing is Yes, it's very is important because the thing is, you're going to get. At some point, they'll say, I want a memo on this. And you say, okay. <laughs> Where's that legal writing book? How do I structure this? How do they want it? And, and it, it's important to, to think about things, how you could be doing things differently now and do it the way your professor wants it. But, uh, so yeah, a lot of memo writing. And then on the smaller cases, uh, at this point, because I just started back in September, I haven't gotten very far into any of my cases, but uh, just filing answers, uh, discovery requ request, handling discovery that comes in. Uh, at this point, I've prepared for depositions. We haven't taken any depositions in any of my cases. So it's just, and it, it could be anything. I mean, I've been asked to do some, some odd things and a lot of document review. But nowadays, I'd say probably the biggest difference between when, when you were practicing is you probably did a, a tremendous amount of document review. Absolutely. That was kind of the way it used to be. Well, now we have departments where it's just document review. They're not actually associates. They're contract attorneys, and that's all they do is review documents. So I don't have to do that kind of document review. It's more I manage some of that, and I haven't really started that yet, but I will manage those relationships. But, um, yeah, it's more about looking for key things. Right. Yeah, I would imagine with that, with the contract attorneys, they, they will bring to you close close calls and privilege questions. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll buy it. What's the oddest thing you had to do? You said you had to do some odd things. Well, I guess the, the actual task isn't that odd of what I'm thinking of, but looking through medical records and looking for things to impeach plaintiffs or witnesses on just leads you down some roads of talking to people. Um, I ended up at a junkyard down in Noonan, which is actually where I'm from, uh, trying to negotiate with how I'm going to um, either buy this vehicle or pay the guy to preserve it for us at his junkyard. And so, I mean, that was, I, I found that to be odd out at this junkyard 
dressed like this, standing in gravel. You know, I mean, I'm from Newton, so I can say I was negotiating with a redneck because that's where rednecks come from, is Newton. I consider myself to be a reformed redneck. So, you know, we're sitting here having this conversation. This guy's looking at me like I'm crazy. But it was just so bizarre to be out there and, and dealing with this. So I, I thought that was uh, pretty odd. But, I mean, and then you, you get the, the call at 11 o'clock at night and says, hey, can you go to court for me in the morning? I think that's kind of odd. <laughs> you know, it's that's not, not odd at all. It's not odd to have to go to court, but, you know, to get it at 11 o'clock. Yeah, you don't look like a redneck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, clean up nice. I bet you stood out pretty much in the junkyard dressed like that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I, I once went to criminal court dressed in my $1,000 suit and the judge looked at me and said, what are you doing here? Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. Same kind of thing. Um, well, so far so good, but what do you... What do you like about what you do? Well, the best thing about my job, there are two things that I really love about it, and one of them is flexibility. We're asked to do a tremendous amount of work. It's, sometimes it feels insurmountable, and sometimes it is, actually. And that, I think it's part of being a young associate is determining when you can't do it, when you have to say no, when you have to go to someone and say, we have to come up with a different plan than what you thought is the way it should go or initially should have gone. Um, but my firm, I don't check in to anyone. I don't have to be at my desk all day, every day. I do work for some partners who want to walk in my door. They refuse to call me. They refuse to email me. They refuse to do anything other than walk in my office and talk to me about something. And they're just old school and that's the way they like it. And if I want to get more work, I need to be sitting there to get it. But other than that, every partner's not like that. Every associate I work for isn't like that. But it doesn't matter if I bill my hours from home at 12 o'clock at night or during the day. I mean, every Tuesday, I'm at the baseball field at 3.30 with my son. Um, every Friday, I'm at his baseball practice. I coach his baseball team. I will never miss a practice unless it's an emergency. Uh, and we have practice at 5 o'clock on Friday. So I have a, a tremendous amount of flexibility to have uh, a great work-life balance and then I, I work with several other young associates and that I work with my best friend who I graduated here with and I mean it's just it, that's an awesome experience to be able to, uh, to to have friends that are your age. Okay. Vernon. Welcome Vernon Strickland. <laughs> Vernon, I tell you, that type of reception, I can come down here every day and stay <laughs> Nobody applauds for me and come in the office there. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Used to. Yeah. Uh, well, Vernon, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's a rainy day out there. You know, you, you, you come a long way. I appreciate that. I apologize for my tardiness, but no, I'm glad to be here. Though. Well, that, 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 that's okay. Once you're to your stature, I'll let you in the door later. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just uh, chatting about life as a brand new associate at Trout and Sanders, and of course uh, you've been a Holland and Knight for a number of years uh, now. Yes. Um, yes. You know what? Um, what might be helpful uh, if you caught your breath here to uh, just kind of introduce yourself to the, the students and tell them you know what it is you do and, and what kind of clients you have, and then we'll just chat from there. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Vernon Strickland. I'm uh, this is my seventh year. Uh, it's hard for me to believe uh, at Holland and Knight. I do primarily uh, defense litigation, uh, which means I represent primarily companies and different types of lawsuits. Uh, and I do some intellectual property on it, dealing with transactions and dealing with uh, litigation. And I do a little, a smidgen of sports law from time to time. But the, uh, the IP side kind of takes me from time to time into the uh, entertainment space as well. So it's, uh, I get a little bit of that, and it's fun. Sometimes I have the opportunities to do it. Uh, but from time to time you get, you know, as a, as a litigator, you get cases that kind of go outside of my normal box. So right now I'm working on a, a class action lawsuit representing LexisNexis, a case that uh, has been going on for a while, but I, I'm just now getting involved with it. We had a, uh, a new partner join our firm, and so I'm kind of getting ramped up and getting involved in that particular case. He brought it over from his previous firm. I'm also uh, working on a case before the Georgia Court of Appeals, very unique from kind of what I typically do. In this case, it kind of came through as a friend of the firm type of case. We're representing a, uh, a parent, a young mother in a, in a lawsuit uh, that was brought by her ex-husband against her for wrongful death of their five-month-old child. So uh, we're on appeal right now in a certain parental immunity defense and things of that nature. 
Uh, but in May, I'll be heading over to France, and this is something very different for me. I'll be heading over and I'll be doing a presentation on entertainment law to a group of college students that are part of a program. This is a festival, an international film festival called the Con Film Festival, and so I somehow got <laughs> chosen, lucked out from our firm to go over and do a presentation on entertainment law to those folks. So, uh, <coughs> yes, excuse me for just a minute. He's at the junkyard at Noonan, and you're at the con. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, told, I told all of you that his job was cooler. Than <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm from Noonan, so I probably prefer to be down there sometime. But uh, so anyway, I, I'll be there in, in May. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of things that uh, you get opportunity to do from time to time. So <laughs> I just told them I'm from Noonan as well. Are you really? That, I, I was just explaining to them that that's where rednecks come from. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a redneck too. <laughs> Right. You guys had no idea what you were getting. <laughs> right. And I had no idea you were both from Noonan. So. <laughs> That's good. Did you go to, which high school did you go to? Northgate. Northgate. Okay. Right, you gotcha. all can catch up later. Vernon, <laughs> <laughs> while we're, uh, I had, had just been asking Brandon about, you know, what it is as a brand new associate at a big law firm, what it is he does. And of course, uh, a lot of it is, is uh, memo drafting and, mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to provide that kind of support to. Mm -hmm the same kind of litigation I think you're talking about, but at the other end of the spectrum of associates life, now seven years uh, out, mm -hmm. could you describe for the students what did you do all day? Because you've probably got a lot of folks like Brandon who work under your supervision. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we, you know, we typically kind of staff somewhat lean, but I, I have like maybe one or two people, so uh, underneath. Uh, so typically how my, my assignment comes in, the, the partner who has a relationship that kind of brings the case in, it's okay. As a senior associate, my job is actually kind of run the point on it. Your job is kind of manage the case and, and kind of push it through. You go to the partner and kind of talk about theory and those type of things. So uh, depending on the size of it, now this, this class action law, so of course there are a number of people involved in that one. And so in that particular case, I'm kind of managing the discovery part of it. I had another big case a couple years ago. We were representing the Coca-Cola company in a, uh, in a uh, copyright infringement uh, dealing with the World Cup. There was a song called Waving Flag by this artist by the name of K-9. And so in that one, I was, I was like the, the main point associate on that thing. And I was, uh, you know, kind of interfacing with the client, gathering all the discovery there. We're trying to collect discovery from 16 different countries and all those individual things. And then I would draft, you basically do the draft and all the motions and all that stuff. And you give it, you want to give a finished work product to the, uh, after you kind of talk through the theory a little bit with the main partner that's managing, you want to give a finished product to him and he'll look at it and hopefully he'll just have to maybe a couple of minor edits or a stylistic thing here and there and then you're getting ready to file it. So as a senior associate, you, you're kind of, you're the person that's doing all the work on it. And so, uh, uh, and then you kind of bounce ideas and that type of thing off of the, uh, off of the, uh, uh, the partner that's on the case. Uh, and also from time to time, you started, you know, at this point in your career, you expect to kind of go out and start perhaps generating some type of business and bringing in some relationships, that type of thing, so. Yeah. One of the things I know this students are always uh, curious about is, you know, is it true you work all the time? I think is, is, is probably the, <laughs> the, best way, the best way to put this. And I'm yes. going to put this to both of you. <laughs> um, what, what, what kind of hours are we really, uh, we really talking about? Because, I mean, I've talked to them about it, but again, my experience is, you know, it, it is so old now mm -hmm. that, that it, it, it really doesn't tell the story today. Uh, and I put a question to both of you. I mean, uh, if you're comfortable answering it, you know, I mean, what on a monthly basis or weekly basis? I mean, how much are you working? I think I think that's an important question. I think it's a, a very important question for anyone who's interested in doing this this type of work. And I'll start by saying my firm requires we have to bill 1850 a year, which is low. Um, and I think the expectation is that you will bill. 2,000 if the work is there. Some practice groups right now in this economy, there's just not enough work to build that many hours. Um, I am in a very busy practice group, and uh, I'm at about my halfway point for my billable year. And unfortunately, this is going to scare some of you, but it's, it's just the truth. I'm on pace to bill somewhere between 24 and 2,500 hours, and that's a lot. Um, I, that is very much on the high end at my firm, but I just work for some very busy people, and for me, that look, what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis is, number one, finding ways to just be efficient, to bill while you are working. And that's that, sometimes that's the hardest part. When you work for an entire day and you've only billed four hours, and, and you're looking at it from just an hour standpoint, mm -hmm. you're thinking, this day, my, it was a wash. You know, what was I doing? Um, but I, I try to be in my office every day by 7.30. Um, I try to get home by 7.30, 
and I'm often um, spending time with my family until my son goes to bed, and then most nights I'm, I'm, I'm back to work. Uh, and right now it's just really busy. I don't think that will always be the case, but, but right now it's, uh, it's just a lot of hours. So. Right. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a 1900 uh, hour requirement, but I've never been on that pace where you are right now the whole time I've, I've been there. But we, you know, like all firms, there's a, you know, uh, somewhat decreased demand for legal services and depending on what the practice group is and that type of thing. Uh, typically, I, I try to I make it a point, and I, you know, I should have brought my schedule in here. I, I had it, and I was kind of going back and forth, although I'm running late already, but I'd say, uh, I do it in 30 minute increments and I started doing it when I was in law school and I find I have to do it more so now with other demands of my life but it's like you know from 4.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. at night and uh, I kind of plan everything I'm going to be doing but and the reason I do that is I try to I make sure I try to dedicate 50 hours per week to my firm uh, and that is and hopefully within that 50 hours I can try to build 40 if I'm you know if I'm efficient but sometimes you get in there and as they alluded to I mean you may spend you know 10 hours in the office and you come out, you only build four hours, and so the, the problem is trying to make sure you're getting other distractions off of your plate and things that are not necessarily billable work in order to get to the billable stuff. And so, you know, like client administration and talking about, you know, uh, invoices and things of that nature. I mean, you, you can't bill for that type of thing. And so, it's always about trying to get to uh, trying to get to where you, to the work that you can actually touch and build and build on. And so that adds value to the client. Uh, that's the that's the. That's the kind of key term that what's, what's going to add value to what the client's objectives are. And either you're defending this lawsuit or prosecuting this lawsuit or prosecuting this trademark or, or things of that nature, doing this licensing deal. And so that's what you want to you know, kind of make sure you get your hands into. But uh, so typically, my, my objective is to try to leave my house by 7, be in the office at 7.30, same thing at, there. But uh, I made a, a resolution this year to be home by 6.30 unless there's an exception to it. And so I got two little ones. and. And trying to you know spend time with them, and then uh, you know the other things and uh, uh, things I'm involved with, like today I'm down here doing this, and then uh, Saturday uh, I'll be at a law conference that uh, I'm on a, uh, um, part of a, a nonprofit organization that we're, we're putting on, and so there are other things that kind of take up your time, and so you have to be very deliberate and intentional about okay, because no one's sitting there saying hey, you need to be sitting at your office at this particular time, and if you're not careful, the other demands can kind of bleed in and take take precedent over the time that you need to be dedicating, and so. Particularly, I find it challenging when, like, say, for instance, there's not enough work that are there available. Like, as of this week, I, I probably have, there's a, there's a Pelley's brief. The Pelley's brief should be due today, and so that should take up all, you know, majority of my time uh, preparing our reply brief in this case that's before the Court of Appeals this week. In addition to doing some discovery, and I got a couple of uh, memos advising some clients on a couple of things that I need to get out. But in a typical week, I may only have, there may only be, like, at the beginning of the week when I plan on my schedule, hmm, that looks like I only have about 25 hours worth of billable work. So the temptation can be you can either, you know, well, I'm head out of the office, that type of thing, but the other part of that time you gotta be hunting up work. You gotta go into developing relationships, and that's another issue I'll get into, uh, and I'll allude to it when Professor Long gives me the opportunity. But you know, a lot of people think it's all about talent once you get in this particular space. And that's one of the things that I had the hardest lessons I had to learn kind of coming into this place. You do things here, you, you know, you get you get an assignment, you go to the class, you have the exam. You go in and you can do extremely well on it, and, and, and that's the end of the day. And you write well, you learn how you learn those uh, tangible skills. But once you get into actual practice, it's about 70% about the relationships. And that's one of the things that you have to kind of you know, learn and deal with. But I, I'll talk about that uh, once, you're, you know, once we move Well, on okay, that. we'll make sure we get to that. Yeah. <clears throat> but I wanted to, to follow up since we're talking about how hard you both work, and, that, and those numbers don't surprise me at all. Um, what do you like about what you do? I mean, you, you're doing an awful lot of it, and so there must be something that you that you like about uh, the work. Yeah, you what, the what do you yeah, work? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not talking about yeah. the paycheck. I know the yeah. paychecks are nice, mm -hmm. uh, but what do you like about what you're actually doing? And I know that's going to be different for the two of you because mm -hmm. you're in very different states. Yeah, I'm, it's so early for me. Everything I, I don't know anything about any of the substance. It, it's just so. The substance of the work, it's hard for me to like because at su some point it all would be the same. I'm just trying to find my way. What I like about it is that it's very difficult. Um, the legal issues, I've spent time just staring out my window thinking, how in the world, what does this mean? How can we formulate it? And it's just so, what you find is that, especially in litigation, when you're reading opinions and judges and clerks who write these opinions view the law <laughs> differently and you're trying to 
discern what the law actually is or what it should be and what you would like it to be. And sometimes, I mean, it's just some of the issues have been so difficult that I, I've written about, and I really like that. I mean, so it, it drives me crazy. It makes you sweat. It makes you want to pull your hair out. Um, when you get writer's block um, as a lawyer, it's a very strange thing, but it happens all the time. And it's just, that's what I like the most about it. Very yeah, that's funny you say that, because that was one of the things I loved about it, because it was doing something hard well, was yeah. it, you know, was it so. Yeah. Thank you, Vern. Yeah, I, I would have to echo uh, a, a part of that. I think once you dig down into the uh, minutiae and, and kind of get a, a somewhat difficult issue, particularly when the ball has been volleyed back at you by your by your uh, opposition in a particular case, and it's like, man, I just don't, you know, I don't know how we can, you know, kind of, Formulate that's going to be a winnable argument in this particular case based on the uh, based on the issue. But you know, once all of a sudden the light bulb comes off, and then you start pulling up pieces together, and then you're able to you know draft a very good brief. That's that's very satisfying. I do get a, a kind of rush, and I like getting involved in those particular things. I don't particularly like kind of some, sometimes I have you know I have cases. I'm like the I'm the super repo guy here. I work, we represent uh, BMW Financial on a lot of different matters, and so so typically that's a that's a tough one for me. I mean, I get that's kind of I'm cranking them through when those things come in, where somebody doesn't voluntarily want to relinquish their vehicle, so they'll come and I do I get what they call us a, a petition for rid of possession, and so I'll get this court order and I get the sheriff and go out and take the vehicle, that type of thing, but. That's not as gratifying because it's just kind of, I'm cranking through a large number of them, but I, I do you know, get a sense of gratification from when the client's happy. Uh, say, for instance, just recently I, we were doing this, uh, there's a, a producer of a television show series that they wanted to kind of get into a movie. And so she had been approached by some folks that wanted to do like a development agreement and get some financing. And she's like a startup, that type of thing. But she was just so delighted when we were able to kind of pull the thing together for, uh, you know, based on a relationship. So that's, that's something that when you're helping people, that's something I that really, you know, get a, a good sense out of that as well, a sense of enjoyment. But probably one of the things that are even more fun, I like starting to develop the relationships and trying to generate business and that type of thing. That's, that's, that's fun as well. But to the extent you get a chance to, you know, you brought on client pitches and developing relationships with folks at other organizations that are able to, you know, utilize our services. So. Well, you both came through law school uh, here, I guess, you know, seven years apart or so. What, when, when you left here and went out into practice, what surprised you? What, what was it you, you didn't know was coming or that we didn't prepare you for? Uh, in some <laughs> Well, to say what didn't, what I wasn't prepared for, you don't learn how to actually be a lawyer here. And, and that can, kind of sounds kind of harsh, but at, at least from a litigation standpoint, I think it's even worse, or even more so from a corporate standpoint. You don't, the skills you need to have to respond to discovery requests and things like that, I mean, you're just not, there's not a large pleadings practice class here where they can teach you this is how you handle pleadings when they come in. Um, so. That was what I wasn't prepared for, I guess. Uh, but I was prepared to write memos. I feel like I, had a, I was absolutely ready to write. I mean, there's a, a large focus in law school on writing and, and identifying issues and handling those issues. So I was certainly prepared for that, which is, has been absolutely helpful for me. Um, but what was the other part of the question? What, what yeah. surprised you? Oh, what surprised me? Oh, the things that people will say. Absolutely. Witnesses, um, lawyers, it, it's just even judges. Uh, people will do. Once they make up their mind that this is the right thing, this is the position that they're going to take, some people will defend that to the end. And it takes a lot to show them, hey, not only are you completely out of line, but, I mean, this is, the law is clear here. Uh, and they still, people just will say and they do anything. We've, I, I had a witness tell me this crazy story about this car wreck. And when it came down and we got the evidence out there, her story was so far in left field, it was just not even plausible. She clearly just made it up. And she's a, a disinterested witness. But she did it. And lawyers all the time. The lawyer defending that case defended the case until the very end. It was a, a car wreck where they were claiming a telephone pole just fell and they hit it. And that there was no way that she could have hit the pole. Or she could have hit the pole. When we found the car at the junkyard I talked about earlier, there was this beautiful <laughs> indention where clearly she hit a pole straight on that was standing up. Then we went back and looked at the pictures of the car that they produced in Discovery, and they were just moved over, and it was just cropped right out. You know? Finally, I called the guy, and I'm like, hey, man, why don't you save us both some time and dismiss this? And he's like, oh, no, no, you know, these people were hurt. And I said, I'm going to send you some photos. And 
we'll see. Call me back and we'll talk about Ben and he, if he withdrew from the case the next day. So, <laughs> but the witness is still defending that that bowl fell down. So you're saw. surprised that witness is lost? I, mean, I, I guess that's, that's what I'm saying, but I, to the extent that I've seen them lie. Yeah, yeah. And experts too, experts will say some crazy things. You know, they're getting paid. At the end of the day, there's an inherent conflict when you're getting paid to say something. What surprised you, Brent? Can you remember back that far? Yeah, uh, one with the, the fact that witnesses, even key central witnesses, parties to the case would actually lie and tell the, you know, kind of twist the story from time to time. But uh, that, that was a surprise there, which was uh, kind of taken aback. I was like, you realize you're under oath? Do you realize <laughs> this is, we're recording this, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Particularly if there's a, a possibility they don't have any, con there's no concrete evidence there. They don't have, like, there's not a document, there's not a, so people get very selective, you know, selective memories that, that during those particular times. But uh, the other thing, like I said, that somewhat surprised me is I think I was somewhat under the expectation that, you know, when we talk about all the hours and the amount of work that's going to be coming, that you kind of, when you first get there, you just go, okay, you, get, you crank in, you do good work, you, you push it out, and then there's kind of an automatic thing where, particularly as a new associate, you know, you know, you'd be in a fortunate position where you're going to have continual work coming. Uh, that might not necessarily the case to a certain extent. I mean, because the, the part of the net necessarily have continual work coming. It's like they're they're out trying to hunt up work, that type of thing as well. So you have to be, you know, kind of savvy and on it about you know developing relationships and, and broadening. I think you're in a, in a really good spot being a part of a practice group there, where it's like that's a, that's a very nice position to be in there. You don't have to, the, the you know the pressure or concern about okay, let me go talk to, you know, every partner that I can possibly talk to and see about, you know, opportunities to get additional work. And you, you would think particularly in the very early stages that that would almost be an understanding is, okay, I'm coming in, you know, kind of learning my, you know, learning my, uh, 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 you know, directions here and whatnot. And so you would think, you know, the work would kind of come through a little more regularly, but that's even, depending on where you, in which firm you're with, that type of thing, that, that's not the case there either. I don't care if the firm is extremely big firm or especially a particularly small firm. So, I mean, you know, with small practices, individual or, or a couple of partners, you're almost expected to go in and start doing some, you know, business generating right off the bat. But, you know, I come from a, my previous career was as an engineer. And so in that particular space, it was like, you know, we did good work. And I was, it was more, I think, institutionalized as my individual piece of the work. It was like, okay, we got the next project in. Who's, you know, who's responsible for bringing the project in? We'll work it out. You do your part on it. But once you get into law practice, it's like, okay, that, that, that project's not going to just come along. You've got to kind of go out and be you know, more uh, uh, proactive about hunting it up from time to time. And that's not necessarily going in and asking for work every time, but it's just getting an opportunity to develop and get to know, you know folks and let them know who you are. And so you're just kind of developing that rapport on, on an ongoing basis. So that was the thing that kind of was like, okay, you know. And, and that's true in my firm, too, even being a part of a practice group. You have to generate the work with the senior lawyers. Well, mm -hmm. and this, is, this is the... the, 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 the uh, segue that I was looking for because the, the real question that you all are addressing now is how do you succeed mm -hmm. as an associate in a mm -hmm. firm like this yeah. and that's different at your stage than it is at yours yeah. but you've been through where he is yeah. so if you all could explicitly address that I mean how do you get work how do you succeed how mm -hmm. do you how do you advance and then that's when you I, I want you to talk about this relationship piece mm -hmm. that you alluded to earlier is that mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and that, that's exactly that's what it's all about. It's about the relationships that you can develop with the partners or the senior associates that are going to be dishing out work because when, when Vernon gets something, I'm sure he looks at it and says, okay, I need a younger associate to do this. Who am I going to give it to? Which associate do I like to work with um, if you have a choice? So, it, and like he said, you're there and it's not just I have this, this database of work I can go to and pull from and do it. I, that's not how it is. You have to find that work or they have to come to you with the work and I think to say how do you succeed as an associate um, I think for me how I try to succeed is number one I try to be prompt and the people I'm working for I want them informed I want them to know this is where I'm at I want them to have it in a timely fashion I want it to be thorough I know at this stage I don't have years of experience to lean on in my analysis so that I can say okay what you'll find in the law is the way things happen in reality and how a judge is going to look at it and how that rule is going to play out is oftentimes very different than how this appellate court case went because facts are different. So I don't have that analysis of standing in front of a trial court and having them tell me how the law uh, plays out in practice. So what I try to do is get, for, for instance, with a memo or a brief, I want all of the law to be on the paper and I want it to be right. 
I, my analysis they can disagree with. That won't hurt my feelings. I have thick skin. They will disagree. Mm -hmm. They will pick it apart. Um, but I want it to be, I want all the law to be there. So I want, want my research to be extremely thorough. And the other part of that is editing. It is so important to edit your work. I, I, the way I can destroy my relationship is to be late, to not communicate, and to do, put out a, a poor work product. And I mean that my answers don't have to be right. But if I'm sending something in and I didn't proofread it close enough to, to where there are periods missing, um, S's off, I mean, just little things. Like, that's all I can control right now. I can master my work product, what goes off my desk. I spend a tremendous amount of time editing my own work. And I bill it. And if the partner wants to write that off, that's fine. Um, by write that off, that means they can, if, if I keep track of my hours, I enter my time. It gets billed to the client, but the partner looks at it first and he can write it off and say, okay, he, that took him six hours, we're only going to build a client for. So I put my editing out there and I think that um, that I've developed a relationship with, with the partners and the associates that I work for that they know that they're not going to have to spend a lot of time editing my work from that. So they can trust it. And it's almost as if these people that funnel your work are, are, are kind of like clients. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, you're servicing them the way other lawyers would, you know, would be servicing that's, them. That's exactly right. I don't. At, at this stage, I have very limited access to clients, um, it, very rightfully so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, so it, it is, yeah, the partners and the associates I work for are absolutely like clients. I have to keep them happy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those are, I refer to those as my internal clients, the partners or, or other associates and folks that I work with. Uh, but I think that I can sum it up in a simple matter. It's like the things that associates, the top performing associates do, though not asked to do them. And so that's the way I think that you have to approach it. One is, you know, regular communications about whatever the particular matter is, and I mean, uh, the particular issues that you're working on, and then turn around on a timely basis. But one thing I started doing was, particularly when we get involved in like litigation, if I get involved early on, I create these outlines to kind of land out the case, not just from the, uh, from who the parties are, who the, uh, uh, you know, kind of what our discovery issues are going to be, what the main issues and the spot of the issues of the case is going to be, who the client, and whatever tangential issues. And so it's kind of a three or four part outline and I do it in this nice and technicolor and so as we move the case along I'm continuing to pop you know populate this outline you know where, where we are in the case and so it's like a book it's like if I, if I got hit coming in somebody's okay I see the theory of the case and then ultimately I'll define what success or failure is in the case so and that's one thing that you know kind of taking ownership and being proactive the, the, the part's like okay this guy's really thinking you know broadly about the case and that's something I've done and it's worked very well as well as being able to find what success and failure is uh, with, you know, for our particular case, because sometimes we get in, it's like, man, we got a losing case. There's no way. I mean, from a, you know, from a decision from the court, they're, they're going to win it or lose it. So how do we decide, how do we just define success for the client and the, where the client will be happy? And so another thing it does is really help to to streamline communication about what their expectations are, what our expectations are, and about what they would deem, you know, to be. And we can be very frank with them right off right offhand. And as things kind of move along, it's like we have the outline created. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we got a, you know, we got a wild card that came here that kind of threw something that we had presumed that was in here. It, it gave us a different window, and so we can kind of change things and move them along that way. So that's one of the things that I do uh, typically, and one of the things that I've seen that are very helpful. But you know, a big key part of that too is wanting to be involved in what they call client service team. You don't want to be a one-off, so you want to be a, a part of the relationship. Like if you have a, there's regular work that's coming from a particular client. Like in this case, BMW Financial, we do a lot of work for it. I want to be in the pipeline of the guys, hey, you know, where the client is eventually calling me up, you know, for those particular types of work. And so it helps me to be aware and understand what the client's business is and, you know, and kind of have a good understanding about what it is that they do on a daily basis and how can I add value. You know, a lot of times, you know, I just want to, you know, come in and you just, you know, litigate a case. I want to figure out how can you add, you know, add value to it. So I try to, you know, kind of, if I wrap up a case for, in particular, some of these repetitive actions, if, you know, comes out successful or, or, or unsuccessful, to say, hey, you know, here's some things that you want to think about in the future so I can get, you know, a little bit more information or, or, or uh, some education for the client, you know, the client contact. So that's kind of what I've done. Can you speak what that Well, for the, for, for the next step in your career, uh, which presumably is partnership, um, you're going to need your own clients, I assume. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, when do you start working on that and what do you do uh, to do that? You start like from day one, actually start in law school. So part of it is it's all about your relationship. You never know where one of your peers is going to end up, you know, in a, in a short order or a short time. And so, you know, in talking with some of my peers, I'm, I'm a non-traditional law student, so I'm a little older. This is a third career for me coming into it. So, um, 
there are people that I went to undergrad with that are already in positions where, you know, at their respective organizations or things of that nature where they could actually, you know, be doling out work or make recommendations on who should get it. So the, you got to want to think along those lines is really, you know, cultivate a relationship, let people know who you are and what it is that you're doing. A lot of what we do in the legal space, people call it, you know, it's fungible. I'm sure you all heard that, you heard that term yet so far, which, which class is that they first been? Is that sales? Fungible goods, yeah. But anyway, it's fungible, like, you know, to some extent, everybody's doing the same thing. You know, you got smart lawyers at Trout, you got smart lawyers at Holland and Knight, at King and Spalding, wherever else. What's the thing that differentiates you is the relationship, the rapport. It's like, man, I, I like this guy. I've known him since forever. And so that's a part of, you know, kind of cultivating the developed relationship, even now where you're in law school. The other part of that is I go to conferences. So I, went, I was in one in Philadelphia early this year. So I'm meeting attorneys, like there's a, what they call the National Bar Association. They have this commercial law conference. I'm meeting attorneys that are in private practice like myself, but sometimes the folks that go in-house are people that have come from private practice. So developing relationships with them, developing, developing relationships with more junior uh, uh, in-house people, that type of thing. And as they grow in their career, I'm trying to invest. My objective is to try to invest in them. To say, you know, what can I do to help to move the ball forward? Them? Help them to yeah, shoot, shoot them an article or things of that nature or just kind of stay in contact. And so that's, you know, particularly important. That's the way that I'm, that I'm going about, you know, doing it now. There are people that are on my same practice level, I mean, as far as years of experience or closer to it that are actually in-house, you know, doing things. And so I've, you know, developed a relationship with them. We take them to the break. We have, our firm has excellent seats at the break. <laughs> First row, we're right behind, we're right behind the visiting team dugout. So if you got kids, they'll come up with visiting team, but throw the ball to the kids. So that's always a, it's a great thing. And it's just an opportunity to get a chance to go hang out, you know, and then, and then, and then of course, to get a chance to see your work product and things. Oh, man. So some of these clients is like, uh, particularly, you know, some of our major clients is like, I, they've, they know my work. They've already, you know, they've seen it before and that type of thing. So now it's about me continuing to, continuing to develop, you know, relationship with them and just trying to figure out ways we can get a chance to know each other and how can I be helpful to them and hopefully some someday soon vice versa. So okay. you would listen to this, Brandon? You, Absolutely. <laughs> they, 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 they preach it to you. Um, this is a big part of our orientation process is, hey, these are some of the things you can be doing now so that later on, and it's all about investing in people, that's, that's, that, that's the right word. Is It's hard to identify, I mean, you think about it and you look at, we can pull up our partner rates and to say, okay, how am I ever going to meet someone who's going to pay that? Um, I don't have friends that are going to be CEOs that, that, that I can project now. I don't. Uh, so you have to get out there and from my perspective, what I'm doing now is just joining joining organizations that I think will put me in, in touch with people who, who could potentially be clients, but they have similar interests uh, and, and are in a profession. Uh, and, and obviously, if it's related to the law, if they're associates of other firms, like he said, that's what happens at big firms. You either, I mean, you could leave and do do nothing, but or do something else. But mostly, it's make partner go in house. That that's the most common role that I've seen. And when they go in-house, those people then make decisions. Well, who am I going to give work to? And, and he alluded to that. Uh, so you, you want to be in a, in a position to where you know someone who goes in-house. And the way to do that is just to meet people now. I think it's important to start, like he said, from day one. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating because it was totally different when I was an associate. There was no emphasis on developing wow. you know, business because there was no need to. Yeah. Well, it's cutthroat now. I think that you're seeing that the market is changing and what clients are willing to pay for is changing in their where you have established relationships um, with law firms and clients that before that's all they would do is just go to the same firm. Well, well now rates are the main issue, so they can get <coughs> quality work for cheaper. Yeah. You're at risk of losing that client. Yep. And, and I know my firm is very conscious of that. We represent, represent some clients for 100 years, and we are constantly putting attorneys <coughs> with people at that company to try to match up personalities to make sure that relationship stays very beneficial. Competitive. Yeah, they want to, the people in-house, their job is on the line because they have to give a report to the business units. They're always going to come in and scrutinize how much, if, why do you have to spend all this money on legal? Why do you spend all this money on outside counsel? They got to show, justify, you know, the line items, the money they have in their budgets. So they want to feel like that they have somebody that's in their corner. You know, they, you know, understand you're smart enough to know how to do the work, but are you going to look out for my business and make sure that, you know, once they get it before the CEO of this company, whatever, the legal department looks great, I'm shining. Oh, man, look, you know, we got all this great value when you handle this case that, you know, could have, could, have, could have potentially put millions of dollars at stake, but you only got rid of it for X amount of dollars. And so you want your, you know, that person you had a relationship with to come away is like, that's why I like, you know, Vernon, you know, that's the, that's the way I like it because I know he has my back and he's going to make me, you know, make me a shining star within our organization. So.
Well, I want to turn this over to the students in just a minute and let them ask what they want to ask. But um, I always end these by, by uh, asking our, our guests this. And if, so from the perspective of seven years and from the perspective of ten months, um, is there anything that you wish someone had said to you uh, when you were a first-year law student? Is there any advice? You know, I mean, they, they have to be here, okay? So, you know, they're a captive on. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you wish somebody had said to you? And we'll let, let Vernon go first here. And <coughs> I, I think two, two things. Number one is be very intentional and selective about the things that you take in outside of the space of you know, your academics. I had a tough problem learn, learning how to say no, and so I, I, to some, some time I look back, I'm like, man, I could have been, you know, a little bit more uh, efficient and, and achieve a couple of additional goals if I, I would have learned how to say no about a couple of things that were outside of the academic space. But the other part of that is to make sure you're developing the relationships while you're here. That's the other part is like, man, making sure it's like, you know, whatever people you're connected with, you know what, we're going to develop a relationship moving forward and just kind of staying in contact and continuing to invest in each other, even at this level right here. So I didn't, I, you know, I, looking back, I felt like I didn't do a, a good enough job of that, you know, while I was here because I was taking on so many other kind of task-oriented things. Sometimes you, you, in doing that, you do kind of engage in relationships, but I could have, you know, taken more time to, you know, probably develop relationships with, with a few more folks from my, you know, from my class. But uh, I think that would be the two, two main things that I would, uh, I would say. Okay. And I would, I think that's great advice. And I would add two other things. Recognize the position that you're in. Um, it's easy to get caught up in what's prestigious at, at your stage, but it, thinking about your career, one thing I would do is spend a lot of time thinking about what is it that I want to do. Every decision I make in life, I try to think, all right, at one point I'm going to be pretty much married to this decision. So in, in the, the job world, or think about law school. You thought about law school, a lot went into that, and now you are actually in law school sitting here dealing with it. You have a different perspective now. Try to put yourself in that position when you're, you're actually, you have that job. Um, one of the things I struggle with at my job is sometimes representing businesses um, when money is, is the issue. It's hard to find a lot of purpose in that, in, in, in that it's fulfilling. Like, like Vernon said, when he gets to help people, that's what he said he enjoys the most. It's hard to get to help people when you represent um, a huge corporation. So, but I would spend time thinking, what is it that will make me happy? Um, and to that extent, don't be worried so much with what the starting salary is of a job. That when I came through here, I helped a lot of friends um, get jobs, interview process, things like that. And a lot of them were always concerned with the money. And at the end of the day, you just have to look at the market and say, okay, there are some firms that pay um, top prices while they're training lawyers. That is such a bad system. I mean. I promise you, when I get paid, my work is not, it's just not worth it. And I don't think, to, to a large degree, a lot of it, that's across the board, but that's the way that that part of the system has developed. Focus in on what you want to do, and, and it, it just, that's really hard to think about four years from now, ten years from now, what are you going to want to be doing? Think about that, and then realize, how can I get that job? Who can I talk to? And just get out there and meet as many people as you can, and don't ask people for jobs. Ask people to have coffee. Ask them what their story is. As you can see, lawyers love to talk about themselves. <laughs> Just go meet them, and later on, that relationship can develop. If they're in a field that you've targeted as something you want to do, number one, you can find out if it sounds like something you actually do want to do. Number two, later on, they will fight for you. That's what I found in getting a legal job. This market is extremely tough, and it's going to continue to be tough. But if you can have people like us out there fighting for you to get a job, that's when you can really make some headway. And you can do that. You can start now by just developing relationships. Build those relationships over three years. Stay in touch every six months. Call the guy. People will help you. It's the practice of law. People went through it. Every one of us sat where you're at now. And I, I would love nothing more than to help you guys, to talk to you guys. And, and everybody's like that. Some people are too busy and some people won't. But all your, just pick up the phone and call them. Hey, man, you know, my name's Brandon. I'm a first-year uh, law student here at Mercer. I think I'm interested in environmental litigation. Do you have some time to meet me for coffee? And then, of course I do. I'd love to. Yeah. And then we'll talk about it, develop that relationship with people, and it, you, you will be shocked at what that can do for you. And again, 
while you're here, recognize what you have. The biggest benefit you have is that you can work for free. I promise you, no one in this room wants to take a job this summer working for free, but that is the best thing you can do, and here's why. If you're getting paid as an intern, if a law firm is paying you, then they recognize that, and so you kind of lose that, let's train him, let's give him the best benefit we can, all this opportunity to just go sit and watch. They don't want to pay you to go sit and watch court. I promise you they don't, unless they've already invested in you and they're going to hire you later on, maybe they do. But when you can work for free, you can just, I mean, number one, it's easier to get jobs. There's more jobs available to you. You can get actual practical experience because you have a job and you're not trying to work to make a living. But also, you have very little expectations when you're working for free. I mean, everything you do is a benefit and they love it. And if you'll go in there and treat it like you're getting paid $600,000 a year, you will impress those people. Man. This girl comes in here every day, she beats me to the office, she outworks me, she gives me a great work product, and she's doing it for free. And I didn't even promise her a job afterwards. As a matter of fact, I told her there wasn't going to be a job for her. You can, <laughs> then you have somebody that's in your corner, and you lose that. Guys, there comes a point in time where you cannot do that anymore. I have friends that couldn't get jobs after graduation. They can't go take one for free and try to build this relationship and this reputation. Do it. And work often. You can, there are practicums. You can, I worked every single semester I was in school. I worked for judges. Um, I worked for law firms doing pro bono work and I got cl class credit for it. Um, I did the habeas project here which is a tre tremendous experience because you're actually handling things you will handle as an associate. So create that experience when you leave here have something to show for it other than grades. Everyone that graduates from law school took the same courses essentially. I mean, set yourself apart. You can do that with work experience. And if you can get in a place and work there for three years, I mean, even if it's for free, but man, I mean, where does that put you? If you've worked somewhere for three con consecutive years and say it's a, you say you were doing, it was a litigation firm. Well, now a law firm's looking to hire you when you graduate and they say, this guy's done this for three years. <coughs> He's very far ahead of the guy who hasn't done it or only has one semester. So that's, that would be my advice. That's a little long-winded. No, I apologize, but I, I, I think a lot of people fail to recognize that's that. That's great advice. What questions do you all have for our, our guests this morning? Or have they answered everything you could possibly ever want to know? I would advise you to ask tough questions. Ask questions that, <laughs> I mean, they're there. Some of you want to, to work in firms like us, and, and they're, I think, are tough questions to be asked. Absolutely. Yeah, I would... I would, yeah, I would definitely concur with that. I know you want to ask the tough questions, if, and if you have opportunities where you're trying to make selections among a number of those, or you know, even more than one, you want to figure out who it is that you can have a relationship with. If you don't get a chance to see them, you know, as you're kind of going around, it's like, wait a minute. I, you know, I'm sitting there talking to these people. I'm struggling to figure out how we may have a, a good report. Now, it could, you know, sometimes you can't judge, judge a book by its cover of the first interaction, but. A lot of times, first impressions are, are, are pretty good, pretty good indicators and whatnot. So sometimes, you know, they may make you an offer. I think we've got one. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, have you ever dealt, or I'm sure you have? How often, and, and what do you do when uh, an older, more experienced attorney tries to take advantage of you in some way? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I could, I could maybe maybe narrow that down uh, for you a little bit, but uh, it, to give you an example, if you, um, I made, uh, I was responding to some discovery, or I, I was, I'm sorry, I was answer, answering a, uh, a complaint, so I was filing an answer, and <clears throat> I pulled up with a great system where there's tons of work out there. there. There's rarely something I do where I can't go find a good example of it. And so I pull off this answer from the partner. I actually pulled off like five answers that he had filed. This thing was perfect. I loved it. I was like, man, this is right. I was a month in. I was like, this is going to be great. So I hand it to him. And at the end, there's a, uh, a list of kind of things that are just thrown in. But they're important. One of them is, is a demand for a jury trial. And this particular demand said a, a jury of 12. So we made a demand in our answer for a jury of 12. Well, that's what we did in every other one. So I was like, all right, good. Yeah, it's in there. Didn't even think twice about it. My partner came walking to my office, and clearly he does this to everyone. And he leaned up against my desk, and he dropped it on, on my desk, and he said, why, why did you put that in there? And I just, I mean, I, <laughs> because you did, you know, I, I didn't say that, but I, 
you know, I tried to perk up and be confident. And I said, because if, if we don't demand it, we won't get it. He said, we won't get what? I said, well, we won't get a jury trial. We could waive that. And he said, very good, but why did you say 12 jurors? <clears throat> Just this lump in my throat. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, well, because we want a jury of 12. And if we don't ask for 12, we won't get 12. And he said, Are you sure about that? Uh, absolutely. No, I'm not sure about that. But uh, you know, I, I just sat there and he said, The reason we do this is because you're in state court. And he said, First, I want to tell you, you made the right choice. <laughs> well, there was a choice. And in state court, if you don't ask for 12, you don't get 12. And it's very simple, right? But he said, The important thing is, if, and this is where it gets to, to your question, if you put this in here and it was superior court, it would be wrong. If it wouldn't be wrong, you'd still get 12, but you wouldn't need it. And you would be showing to the other side that you don't know the rules. And that would give them an opportunity to take advantage of yourself. So the way I handle that, and keep people from taking advantage of me, is to know the basics, to know, to understand the rules. I learned a valuable lesson there. Now, every time I get something, I read every rule I can about that to figure out, okay, I don't want to be taken advantage of. I, I, my career is not long enough to have been taken advantage of. At this point, that I know of, I could be getting taken advantage of right now by some opposing counsel that's got this great plot that's going to drop it on me. And, you know, but it hasn't happened yet. But, uh, so that's how I at least try to prevent getting taken advantage of. Vernon, it's hard to imagine anybody trying to intimidate you uh, or take advantage of you, but uh, did some senior lawyers when you were young try to um, put things over on you? Yes, yes. There was a uh, case, I remember specifically, we were representing a uh, this guy had purchased a Gulfstream 7 personal jet airplane. Uh, and so he was suing his, the former fiduciary who had handled the purchase of the sale. Uh, and he was actually in suing. Uh, we were thinking about bringing Gulfstream in as well because, uh, anyway, there's some things that were botched that caused him additional, like, few hundred thousand dollars after he bought it, like all these squawks and things that were involved with Don't it. Don't you hate it when that happens to you? Yeah, I hate that. Like, you you purchase your personal jet airplane. So, so uh, anyway, the opposing counsel, we were trying to get a, uh, uh, an order together to, um, which round, what were we getting ready to do? It was some type of tangential issue. I think we were just going to extend discovery or something like that. And there was this one specific sentence he was trying to get me to put in. I was like, no, I said, it's not. And we kept going back and forth, but he tried like three or four times, and it really ticked me off, though. And he was, you know, kind of. And I was like, "That's I'm not, you know, I might have been born, but I wasn't born yesterday." And uh, and so we were. I think we we got that. We we had that inform information in. And, you know, I finally pushed back the last time, and then like, I think the next day we had this uh, uh, settlement conference where we were, you know, just talking about you know the possibility of settlement, all that thing. And I was just, I was livid. I mean, I was just really livid at that point because you know he's sitting across the table from me. And, and actually, the, he was a senior. He was a junior partner in the case. There was a senior partner. He was a junior partner, and uh, and so we were just kind of going back and forth. And I, and I said something uh, even during that during that time, just kind of let him know I didn't appreciate it. But uh, uh, that you know, I was extra on about. I don't know if your your question may have been more, more internal dynamics. Does that answer your question? Was that an example of uh, what you were asking? I was asking more uh, from opposing counsel, but opposed, okay, yeah, gotcha. So that that was my, that's my example. Yeah, we got time for one. One more. You go ahead. All right. Um, you said earlier that it was about networking in law school to make sure that you had those connections after law school to get the job and therefore, I guess, it would uh, help your career. And you two obviously have done well in your career. Um, but what would, what's, what's something else that you would say that separated you from, say, your peers graduating so that you're not uh, forced to hang a shingle? They are. You know, that's you, you have, I mean, you're doing well, and they're not. What, what do you think? Is something else? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. There was one guy in my class who, he was ranked higher. I mean, he was like, you know, he's one of our top, I think he's ranked in the top three the whole time. And, I, you know, I, I, would never, I would never in the top three. I was in the top, you know, 12, 10 percent uh, uh, when we were doing through this process. But, and I got like four offers, and he, he didn't get a single, I mean, he didn't get a single, didn't get, I mean, he didn't get a single one. And I was always scratching my head, but a part of that is being personable. The one, I, one interview I did, I didn't get a call back for him, and I understood exactly. You know, they, they were you know gracious enough to tell me exactly kind of some things that I was doing during the interview. But I think part of it is really being personal with working on that particular side of yourself. Um, and I, I would think just kind of being a very aggressive, you got to be a hunter out there. I, I mean, I dropped. You know, I had read the book. I read this book called The Law School Confidential when I was getting ready to start law school. I'm quite sure some of you may have seen it, but uh, I see a couple of smiles out there. Yes, yeah, great, it's a great book. It was like my roadmap. But uh, day one, it's like December, whatever that, that day is that now puts out that you can drop your resume, 
that, that next day I was like, I was going to put mine in the mail. I was like, can I put it in the mail this day or do I need to wait the next day? So I was, I was aggressive, you know. So I went out there and, and so my first, I had, a, you know, the, the large law firm clerkship at the end of my first year. And then my second year I had a couple of, you know, a few different offers. And so I was able to split. So that kind of really gave me some leverage, just kind of get the experience early on. And so I worked after my, you know, I looked for, like, it's kind of similar uh, uh, to Brandon. Brandon, I kind of sorry about that. So I said to Brandon, I, I look for opportunities early on. So after my first semester, I worked with a law firm. Every every break, I was working with a law firm, and so I think just trying to get that practical experience and not not waiting. And then the thing that kind of was intriguing about me is because I had previous careers as well, and so those are things at least get you in the door. You know, for me, it was at least to get me in the door and have the conversation, and then you know, have, put together a very good work product. Uh, you know, written work product helped me out a lot. I mean, that was the thing that. After I did my first summer, the, the managing partner for the firm that I worked for in Atlanta was so impressed because I did this uh, memo where they basically just cut and paste into their, their appellate brief, into their brief of this very big case. It was based on just the, the, legal, I mean, the legal writing skills that I had picked up you know, while I was here. They were just really, really impressed with that. So. Uh, I, um, I hate to say this, but we're out of time. Uh, <laughs> if you want to hear Brandon's answer to that question, you can come up after. <laughs> uh, after but join me in thanking our <laughs>